have to stay vigilant. Do you understand? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Guys, give it up for the team from Arcadian. That's how we wake up in the morning. I like it. Guys, thank you so much for being here. This film looks absolutely incredible. I cannot wait to see it. I was just telling you guys, from I was from about five seconds into the trailer. I'm in. I'm in. Um, Mike, set this one up for the for us. This was this was born in your brain. So te tease what the tease what the premise is and, and what inspired you to write it. What inspired me to write it was uh, it was right at the heart of COVID when we were all kind of stuck doing whatever we could do, mm -hmm. uh, and I was stuck in my home with my twin boys uh, who at the time were 12 and are now 16, um, trying to uh, have as much fun as we possibly could given the circumstances. So uh, every night at dinner, I would try to make up a story for them um, with themselves as the stars. Uh, and usually I failed. Uh, but when I came up with this concept and kind of ran it by them at dinner, they were locked in. So I, I thought we might have something. Nice. So, so do they get some co-writing co credit on they this? They deserve were it. You, were yeah. you running by ideas by, by them as you yeah, were Yeah, I'm glad it? they didn't call Ben, because then it would have been really <laughs> difficult, because they had copious notes. <laughs> <laughs> have they seen the film yet? They have. Yeah, yeah. They, they thought it was wonderful. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Stuff. And Ben, tell us a little bit uh, from your vantage point, what, it, what excited you most about lensing this story? Yeah, I love the story about the brothers, because <clears> I... It was very close with my brother. We grew up very close together. We used to direct together. Actually, our first movie we directed was with Nick, and it played here in 2016, The Trust. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I was. I just really uh, responded to the story of coming of age with um, brothers and <clears throat> using this kind of dark apocalypse fantasy world to take all these tropes that I've loved in coming of age movies and just bring them, really externalize them, you know, so... Mm. Things like coming home late from uh, com coming home late will actually kill your father in this movie. Um, so uh, yeah, those sort of things is what I really responded to. Yeah. So it's a great tool for parents to put out there to scare their children. <laughs> yeah. you're honest. Nick, with with every role you do, um, this is something we've talked about. You're always I feel it feels like you're always looking for a unique challenge. You're always looking to do something you've never done before, which is. Extremely impressive considering you've done over a hundred films now. What, what was it here? So well, thank you um, Well, what, what it was here uh, So it's no secret that I'm a big uh, admirer of family drama independently spirited family drama <clears throat> movies like ordinary people East of Eden and um, I'm also an admirer of horror and science fiction mm -hmm. and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to do a mashup where you could have a, a family, and particularly this dynamic, where it's a father and two boys, which is really how I grew up. Sadly, my mother couldn't be around as much as I would have liked her to have been, so my dad did all the heavy lifting. And I also responded, like East of Eden, with Raymond Massey and Dean and Richard Duvalis, that dynamic, and then you apply that to science fiction. And I say science fiction, not horror, because there, science fiction, it could happen. It's, it's not in the dream logic. It, it's something that, uh, you know, these things could evolve. And, and so the decision was to play it photorealistically and naturalistically and try to get to that place of there's nothing abstract or surreal in film performance. We're all trying to be as believable in a photorealistic way. And then on top of that, you collide with these creatures, which uh, to me, that, that was a good uh, experiment. And I'm happy with the results. Maxwell, how about you? How is, the, how is this different from anything you've done thus far in your young career? I feel like this was this was different in, in a wide variety of ways. I mean, um, I think that's what was most enticing about the project right off the bat. Um, reading the script, not really knowing who was involved. I mean, um, just reading about the character, I I feel like throughout my career, I've been lucky enough to play these really Im incredible roles that I've had a great time doing, but they've always been kind of a squeaky or clean um, person. And this was the first role where that I got to play where my character really got to make mistakes. And it was around the time that I was growing up. I went to my, you know, local public high school. My, went to my neighborhood school my entire life. So I still maintained a very normal lifestyle um, outside of this world, living two lives kind of. Mm -hmm. um, and in a weird way, um, 
Thomas is growing up throughout this film um, felt pretty close to home. Uh, growing pains and wanting to break free a little bit and stretch your arms and I think that can speak um, a lot to to a younger generation wanting to grow up and find themselves in a world that doesn't really let them as much anymore. Um, so I think that was pretty enticing about it. Also, going into it, I, I didn't really know what to expect, but I knew right off the bat the first time we looked at the schedule and read the script and um, it was going to be this intense, really incredible shoot in Ireland with some amazing people. So I knew I was going to learn uh, a lot on that project. Um, I learned a lot from everyone here. And Jaden was always that actor who was like a few years older than me and that person I really could look up to as like someone who I wanted to, to, to model what I wanted to do off of and someone I really admired. And then of course, coming to set with Nick, um, every day it felt like I was learning something new and um, every, not to talk about you like you're not here, but, um, but everyone knows you're an amazing actor, but I think a lot of people would be thrilled to know that you're um, as collaborative as it gets on set and you you really are the most generous scene partner. So that, I think we learned a lot through that as well. It was a real exchange, you know, I learned from working with him. I stay forever a student and I get a lot of uh, inspiration working with different gen younger generations because they're full of, they're full of excitement to be there and they, 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 they haven't had their dreams whipped out of them yet, <laughs> which happens so often in Hollywood. Yeah, they're, 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 they're all a billion dollars and a million Academy Awards. So, yeah. so to work with them, I, I get that energy, and it keeps me interested. You know, and I want to point out that Jaden and Maxwell are very different, and I like looking at the differences in their personalities because that's what brothers are like. They're they they they're they're similar and yet different. And I was trying to locate what the differences were and the strengths were and play to the, each of their different individual strengths. So we were very spontaneous and um, <clears throat> kept it loose on set. Ben, with his camera work, was also very loose. He would he would keep it moving, shoot different things at different moments. Sometimes the camera's on our face, sometimes it's on our hands. You never know what he's catching. And it was the same with the acting. We kept it kind of we kept a jazz flow to it. Little things like when Jaden puts the knife in the table and it falls over, you catch that. Little details, you know. Um, but when I watched the picture yesterday, I was very impressed with Maxwell because, you know, the scariest scene for me in the movie is the people when they're when he's he's being captured by the people and they're, they're tying him up. And there's no there's nothing false in his eyes. He really stops the camera and you, there's a lot going on. And I, I love it when you catch that on, on, on film, you know, Sadie, we haven't talked about your character yet. Can you can you tease tease her, set her up, how she plays set in the story up. and also tell us how, what intrigued you the most <laughs> about this project? Me. So Charlotte is the daughter at the Rose Farm, which is the more kind of wealthy farm near the boy's house and she's also very close with Max's character and I think that relationship really intrigued me because it's just one of firsts I mean these are kids who don't have the references that we have nowadays for for what relationships is and are and what what love is really so um, I think that was really fun with Max figuring out how that looks. I think it comes across as well, all the awkwardness and um, the scene with Max juggling and all that stuff, which was <laughs> great improv stuff from Max, um, which he nailed. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, I found the character really well written and she's not kind of like, it's, it doesn't feel forced. She's just as capable and strong as the boys and she's just as clever and just as interesting. and. Um, I really look for that when I, when I go for characters. So yeah, that was the main thing for me. And it's credit to Ben because he, my understanding is he really fostered that improvisational scene where they're talking about how they got there with this apocalypse. And you feel it, there's a, there's a naturalist uh, style and a flow to it. It feels very immediate and, and authentic, you know, and th these two, Sadie and Max, were, were able to find the rhythm in the improv and it, 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 it's electric when you get that on camera. And Ben really was the one that asked them to do that. 
And of course, there are some supernatural co-stars as well. Um, <laughs> can, can we call them pollution monsters? Uh, I know we don't see them in the in the trailer, so I don't know how much you guys want to tease them. Well, I don't. I don't think they're supernatural. I think they're natural. Like like yeah, they're in, they're, in they're it, it could happen. You sure. know, it's it's not metaphysical. It's science yeah. fiction. Yeah. What What are you guys saying about your monsters? What do you want, What do you want people to know? Yeah, I think teasing too much. So yeah, I think the idea was Mike's idea was like, well, what if everything that we've done to this planet coalesces into these horrible things that are that ironically then their purpose is to kind of take care of us. They become the apex predator. Um, I don't know why I just told said what you were, would have said, um, but. And so I took that, and I and uh, me and my brother um, worked on designing the creature um, with that in mind, and trying to make the perfect human nightmare. Um, and uh, and yeah, and uh, uh, Nick, we talked about the creature too, and the idea of the evolution of it. And so there was a lot of influences on it, uh, insects. Um, but then I mean, we're just kind of like all it's fun, like with developing a, a, a character like that, because it, the, it was done through motion capture on set. And so, you know, it's going to be it's going to have certain physical features, but it really did develop as we were um, shooting the film. I was like sketching different concepts of it. My brother who uh, sculpted the creature. He'd send a new sculpt, so it just kept evolving. It actually was evolving while we were making the movie. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, um, and we just wanted it to satisfy certain um, thematic ideas about, um, yeah, the climate and and what humanity has coming for it. And I was really impressed with the complexity of the creatures. Uh, you know, the symbiosis between the creature and and the uh, roaches. You see these relationships in nature, the clownfish and the sea anemone, and also the sound with the chatter. But they kept sort of transmogrifying, and a lot of thought went into the the detail of the complexity. It was more than just oh, that's a scary looking animal. It, it had uh, it, it kept it kept transforming in, in, in our in, before our eyes, and I was. I was was taken by that. Well, Nick referenced this earlier, but maybe um, Mike, I'd love to hear some some additional insight from your perspective about how this film functions both as as a dystopian thriller and also as this family drama. How did how did you strike that 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 balance tonally? Nick referenced it that it's you know it, it, it's kind of a family drama and then like sort of a, a, a science fiction based horror film. Mm. Uh, we we really just wanted to have as many you know. <laughs> good story points as possible and lean on multiple genres, mm -hmm. uh, which, <clears throat> you know, I think, in, and Ben did a wonderful, wonderful job with the, the creatures because we were very much, this is not supernatural. These, these are not ghosts. You know, these are, this is something very hopefully real and therefore much more scary. Nick, you did Renfield recently. There was a cameo in The Flash, but I feel like the blind share of your work in recent years has been outside of the studio system in in, in films like this. Um, how would you sort of characterize your, your, you know, your thousand foot view of the studio system? Do you prefer to work in films of more of this, this scale? I do. I think there's less cooks in the kitchen, less notes I can get on the floor with the creatives, the director, the actors, the writer, and we can just, uh, we have the floor. We can talk, we can we have the time to make our own notes uh, without too much interference. The more money you put into the movie, the more people have something to say, and it can take all the oxygen out of the room. That's not to say I don't want to make studio movies as well. I'll, if you give, if you say, hey, it's universal, we want you to play Dracula, how do you say no to Dracula? And that's right. fun in its own right. But I, I prefer when it's streamlined and it's stripped down and I'm, I'm with the actors and the director and it's just us. And, and I had that with Dream Scenario and I had that with Arcadian and that's when you really find something that I, I think is uh, organic and authentic. 
think you do have National Treasure 3 still in the works. Oh, heck, I, here we go. See, you're the <laughs> one that brings these things up, and they go out and they eclipse everything else. <laughs> no, there is no National there Treasure no, 3. No, no. Oh, okay. No. It's, it's all rumors. Okay. If you, well, if you well, want to find a National Treasure, if you want to find treasure, don't look at Disney, okay? It's okay. not there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for clearing the record. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for being here again. Right. The team from Arcadian. <laughs> Give it up one more time. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye.